Lauren. Um, welcome to the, thanks for coming out. Welcome to the Women in Machine Learning and Data Science with uh, Microsoft Reactor Meetup. So happy to have all you guys here tonight and so happy to see so many first timers at the meetup tonight. That's really exciting. I'm Alexandra, I'm one of the co-organizers of the meetup with um, Erin. Unfortunately, she's sick tonight and wasn't able to make it, but um, we are really in store for um, some great talks. We've got Rita and Lauren. Lauren is a machine learning engineer on the Microsoft um, commercial services team. Um, and um, <laughs> commercial, commercial software um, team, sorry. I like swear I rehearsed that beforehand. Um, and then Rita is an open source engineer and they're gonna talk about um, sequence classification with time series data, finance time series data, which is something that um, a lot of data scientists out there are working with, and also um, how to do TensorFlow models at scale with Kubernetes on Azure, for those of you who are getting into the container space. So um, great talks tonight. We're gonna start with, um, with Lauren and then move on to Rita, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Alexandra. So my name is Lauren Tran. I am a machine learning engineer on Microsoft's commercial software engineering team. And I've been doing um, machine learning projects at Microsoft for the last three and a half years or so, um, usually focus in the areas of image recognition and image classification, but I do um, work in many different domains in machine learning. So the project that I wanted to share with you today happens to be on financial time series data. And um, it's a project that I just wrapped up with a financial interest so we'll dive into that a little bit more. Uh, so what exactly is commercial software engineering? So we are an organization of software engineers at Microsoft that work on various different projects with um, the community. So we work with students, startups, professional developers, partners, customers to help code um, projects with them. So when you have an interesting technical challenge or a project that you want to solve, um, we like to partner with people in the community to help build those problems. And then we come back and share the learnings with communities like yourself. Uh, so a a little bit of um, coding, some evangelism, and uh, many hats in between. All right, so the data, the, the problem that we're solving, to, uh, that I wanted to share with you today is on financial default prediction. So I worked uh, recently with an organization of credit unions where the scenario they had was to be able to see if they could predict which of their members were likely to default or not based on the transaction histories of these members. And the impetus for this project is they have um, lots of situations where when they can detect financial distress, when they do know that someone is in distress, they can proactively reach out. So they will you know, do something like get them on the phone and say, hey, we know this bill is coming up. Um, maybe we'll help you pay that down. They actually gave an example of paying down a washer and dryer for a particular member to help them a little bit get above water. And if they can do that, then it actually helps prevent a uh, larger default in the long run, and that makes it better for everyone. So in this scenario, um, we have a data set of financial transactions and members who have defaulted or not, and that naturally leads us to a binary classifier, right? So our approach here was to build a binary classifier um, with a couple of different methods. So I uh, started with some traditional machine learning uh, methods using um, a support vector machine and then went into some deep learning methods using LSTMs and CNNs to solve the problem. So I'll talk through all of those um, implementations. So the data, the data that we had uh, w available to us were the transaction histories of members. And we knew whether they had defaulted or not. And we also knew what they were spending, what categories they were um, spending in. Um, this is, you can see here a list of some of the categories that we did use. So think similar to mint.com, right? Your transactions roll up into a certain category. And by looking at these categories, could we build a data set and do some feature engineering to build out our feature vectors to solve this problem. And here's how we did the feature engineering. So um, what we did to incorporate this notion of time, so we have uh, samples of people and we have features about them, what they've spent, how do we actually capture time? 
So we did, to, to solve that, the first um, approach that we tried is taking uh, the transaction activity, aggregating it monthly, weekly, daily, and creating a feature vector from, that, from those aggregates. So you can see from this um, sample data here, we, you have the label, you have the ground truth, right, for each member, and then you have a um, vector of all of the categories, the transaction categories, and the weekly sum of what they did in that week. And then you concatenate that over and over, and I have the, just this red line drawn through so you can see that um, time period one all the way through time period 120, and there, there were several more time periods that we took into account, but um, that kind of shows you that transaction category is rolled up by week and over time. Again, to kind of do this in a notation format, to make it a little bit clearer, we have samples down the rows, features across the columns, like you would um, structure a typical machine learning problem, right? And um, for t naught all the way through uh, Tx, you have um, separate weeks, and then you have, um, I have a tuple here under the features, so F is for features. I have a tuple representing, the first tuple is the um, time slice, and the second is the, corresponds to the, the category. So um, with that, that's a very typical, you know, it's a feature engineered process to get you your feature vectors that you'll feed into a machine learning algorithm. And what we started with was traditional machine learning. So um, one of the things that, you know, we kind of run into being in commercial software en engineering is we'll see partners and, and startups and um, customers in very different stages of the game. So they might not always know something about machine learning and that's okay, that's totally fine. We'll, we'll work with them to educate them and help them come up to speed. And the way that I've found works really well is to start with traditional machine learning, start with something like a support vector machine where it's pretty intuitive, right? If you draw out this example, this image of, um, a support vector machine with uh, samples projected into the feature space and then a hyperplane drawn through them, it tends to be um, more intuitive of how you might separate those classes. And the notion of separability um, gets well il illustrated here. So this is where we started. It also happens to be a really good um, algorithm for our specific case because um, SVMs work very, very well when you have many, many features, right? When you're working in high dimensions. Also works really well when you have um, fewer training examples. So we only had a couple of hundred training examples per class. So given that, we started here and actually did, it worked pretty well. Um, I used a couple of different tools. Um, I'll show you one of them. This one is a tool that I like to use when I kind of first get my hands on some data just for prototyping. So let's see. So I'm reading in my data, and th this takes a quick 20 minutes to build. This is the Azure Machine Learning Studio. And when I get to the end, I, okay, let's see. Let me go ahead and refresh that. Should come up shortly. So yeah, what, what I'll do while this is loading is I'll bring in the data, see if it is separable, and if I get a pretty good rock curve on my binary classifier, then I know that I have um, data, I've engineered features that are gonna work pretty well. So um, to show you, I've, I've got this module that shows me, shows me a visualization on the, on the output here. Looks pretty good, right? Pretty good rock curve. So given these metrics and that rock curve, I know that we're ready to, to go. I can teach this to a, a startup, a customer who is new to machine learning and have them really understand the um, machine learning process. And I'll flip back over here so, to kind of show you how, how this works. So, all right. I've got my machine learning workflow on, on the right hand side and this tends to be really good for education and then once you understand the process of reading in data, normalizing it, splitting, training, testing, evaluating, then um, you can easily transfer that to code, right? So get right into scikit-learn and it's a pretty close, not exactly one to one, but it's a pretty close mapping of how these things work so it's a really good um, stepping stone. So we go into scikit-learn and, and do an SVM implementation and get pretty good results at 92% accuracy. All right, 
So next, now that we've uh, gotten in into Python and we're writing code with Python, scikit-learn, then it's a natural time to introduce how we might solve this in a deep learning approach, right? So LSTMs were, the, they stand for long short-term memory networks. Um, they're very, very good at sequence classification and sequence labeling. They also happen to be very good at forecasting, but um, in this case, we use them for classification. So given a specific sequence, can you determine which class it belongs to? And if you think about it, we have time series data, right? We have sequences of transactions for people who have defaulted and sequences of transactions for people who have not defaulted. Given that, can we feed it into an LSTM and get us something. All right, um, so the data input here, before I showed you something that was 2D, we had, it was like a spreadsheet, right? Rows of samples and then columns of features. Now I'm gonna turn that into a 3D matrix where now I don't just have samples and features, I have samples, time steps, and features. Um, you saw this before. I'm gonna simplify this notation just a little bit to take out that tuple. Um, it, it is a bit redundant if you understand that it does correlate to the time slice. And um, what I'm gonna do is just transform this into not just samples and features, but samples, time steps, and then features. So you're really just projecting the data into a 3D um, representation of it, where at each time slice, you get the features for that happened at that time slice. So we're still looking at weekly aggregates. Um, to make this just a little bit more clear, um, I've labeled sort of the columns and, uh, and the rows that we have here. Again, you're training examples down the rows, and then um, for us, we use the transaction categories and the dollar amounts that they spent per each week. And then you can feed that into an LSTM. I'll actually go and kind of show you um, the code for that a little bit. All right, so. So here is um, the Azure Machine Learning Workbench, and um, it, we have a, a couple of different tools, but I wanted to show you um, my code that I have here. Um, and this is really the, the meaty part right in here. So this is in Keras. After you define your model, then you just build your LSTM layer, right? And um, you're defining the number of time steps, the number of features, and the number of output nodes. And then following the um, LSTM input layer, then you add a dense layer to handle the classification step. So the dense layer is just the fully connected part of your neural network. And that will, with, with a sigmoid there, that will give you the classification. Does it belong to zero or one, not default or default? And if I go over to my run history, I can take a look at um, the latest run that I did and ha how that performed. So I'll, I'll scroll all the way down. Um, and uh, in this particular run, we got to 93% uh, accuracy. Yeah, so next we have um, a CNN. And the reason I wanted to use a CNN is while they are typically used in image-based tasks, they also happen to be very good with sequence labeling. And the reason why is because CNNs, if you think about the fact that they're good at images, that means that they're good at spatial relationships, right? So understanding where pixels are in images, they're, they're very, very good at understanding. So given that nature of them, that quality of being um, excellent at spatial reasoning, they, they're a really good fit for a problem like this. And we did find that um, we got to about 95% accuracy here. The only difference that you have is that instead of using a 2D filter um, kernel, you'll use a 1D filter. So you, some of you might be, many of you I'm sure are familiar with a CNN model where we do image classification. Um, you'll see the kernel on the right hand side on that car that's a 2D kernel that will slide across that image to, to do feature extraction. For um, non-image data, you would just use a 1D kernel, pretty simple. So what you do is you have a kernel, this is, a, this is just illustrative of, of a convolution step. So I have a kernel of size three, I have my stride set to two, so what that means is this kernel is going to slide across um, with two steps and we're going to take the dot product to get the output to our feature map. And that's gonna go so on and so forth all the way through the end of that input vector. And um, I will show you quickly how that looks in code. 
I think the aspect ratio causes a little bit of a lag. All right, so if I go over to my train CNN model, then it's very similar. Um, this, this is the crux of it here. We define our model, do our convolution step, then um, the typical uh, dropout and max pooling step, so dropout to prevent generalization or prevent overfitting, sorry, to uh, your training set and allow better generalization and a similar flattening so that we can take all of those output feature map, flatten them into one um, single high dimensional feature vector that can then be fed into the algorithm, into the dense layer. All right, and finally, the last thing that we did is I talked to you about weekly roll-ups, weekly um, aggregation. The financial institution that we worked with was highly, highly interested in seeing if we could just take raw individual transactions. What if we didn't aggregate anything? Could we find a pattern? You know, their thought was, hey, what if someone takes a huge, um, a sum of money out of an ATM at a casino and then they go get a payday loan, or can it pick up patterns like that to, do the, to determine whether they're likely to default or not? Um, we found that by feeding in individual transactions, we did get to about 75% validation accuracy. We, didn't ha we only, again, had a couple hundred samples per class, but um, traditionally, you know, the way neural networks work is if you feed in a lot more data, then you'll get better results than if you were to use a traditional ML model. So our, our thought is that with more data, it will be able to, the LSTMs will be able to learn those patterns and, and get you a, um, better, better than 75%. All right, and this is what I showed you before. Um, the way that we structure um, individual transactions is just slightly different. Instead of doing um, it with weeks on the time steps, we actually are showing uh, transactions on the time steps. So those are observations. They can be structured the same way, where instead of an actual time, like week, month, or day, you can use observations in your LSTM matrix. So we have transaction not through um, 2,000 transactions. We found that that was actually pretty effective going back 2,000 transactions in time. And then instead of uh, a weekly aggregate of, uh, of dollar amounts for each category, we have the category shown under, on the features as well as the amount, the year, um, month of, I think it was, yeah, year, month, day, and hour to inject back in time. So by using transactions, you lose that notion of time, right, instead of time steps. So we actually tried to inject it back in in the feature space. All right. So that was that project. I have my code up on GitHub. Um, we also are always looking for great projects. So if you have an interesting machine learning project or something else that um, sh I, I showed on the first slide about commercial software engineering, you can come talk to me after the talk. And um, are we about at, should we transition directly? Yeah, so um, we don't have time for Q&A right now, but do feel free to come up to me and then. Yeah, awesome. Okay, any questions while Rita is setting up? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.